heads before bearding. Well, back in the day, everybody had a rapper and a DJ. So I was the rapper. I met a DJ. Just made sense to combine the two. The bag story is we met at Furs Cafeteria on 78th and State. I was the bread's uh, bakery. And in, one day in comes this tall, lanky white dude, you know, and I said, uh, hey, how you doing? How you doing? He's like, hey, what's up? And, uh, <laughs> and I said, uh, what kind of music you like? He said, he looked at me, hip hop? And I was like, oh, hell yeah, we're going to get along great. And uh, we have ever since. He worked in the bread section. I got hired for a veggie chef. I was in charge of the okra, the mashed taters, the soufflés or soufflettes. And uh, all of the cooks back then would all swap. You know, the meat guys would be throwing steaks over. He'd be tossing over blueberry muffins. And I'm sitting there hungry as hell. Don't nobody want a green bean? Jalapeno <laughs> so, cornbread. Jalapeno cornbread. That was Went the bomb. Well. But uh, nobody wanted vegetables. It was a lonely time that <laughs> at first cafeteria for your boy. Oh, I'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but here you go, Jay. A couple muffins, man. Go get you something to eat. Daryl McDaniels, DMC, from Run DMC. And a close second would be Ecstasy from the uh, group Houdini, Killer Voice. John Williams, the composer, is my first music influence. And Isaac Hayes, and the producer of DMC, Houdini, Fat Boys, Larry Smith. How can I just talk to you? How can I just let you know? He's the gear guy. Yeah, but you bought the first keyboard. Okay. <laughs> I bought the first piece of equipment. I stole the first piece of our equipment. I By hustled our next piece of equipment. By any means necessary. We needed recording equipment. It was very expensive, so... You want those? So. I got those. <laughs> Yes. You need those? Got those too. <laughs> if we don't got it, we can get it. Basically, by any means necessary, attack. We we had decided we were going to do music and we weren't allowing anything to stop us. Around the stage with my lights on. Eight to five, I lead a different life. SP-1200. SP-1200. Hey. The man behind the mic. Hey. Grew up broke as hell. Four or five thousand dollars was cracking it. Everybody wanted the SB twelve hundred. We had an HR sixteen B Elisis, no bass, but it didn't stop us from making music. Wow! Oh, ballpark Frank. That was our first song that we did together. It was a song about a little feller that I didn't like too much. We'll just leave it at that. Let's sneak away, let's sneak away, sneak away. No. Next question. Let's sneak away. Let's sneak away. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you was actual pressed up out for sale. The other stuff we did was hand-to-hand, -hand, flipping it, parties, DJs. And some of those still exist amazingly to this day. We had tapes before that that we flipped on the underground. 30, 40. 100. It was a, it was a bunch until selling narcotics. Fucking on the floor, because I did. <laughs> Mine was ghetto bitches, just because, you know. Pew, 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 Love you guys. <laughs> I'm the bad guy. I don't know why. I'm the one who tried to be a fly. Oh, illegal copying of cassettes. The greatest invention ever, right? And whatever people didn't illegally take, we sold out of the trunk of my vehicle. We would go to record shops all over Kansas City and get consignment deals and tried to hustle and get as much stuff as we could. Yeah. 
hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hit the car wash, put it in. People, oh man, we don't want to hear that. Oh, just check it out, check it out. They pop it in. All of a sudden it's like, I'm from the dot. Like, oh, really? Oh. It's flipping. It's like legal dope. Straight as an arrow and I fly like a sparrow. Packed all my bags, moved to Rio de Janeiro. Left the U.S. and I'm good to the G.O. Ain't no place in the world like it is down in Rio. Ho, taming motherfucker. Mm. I think mine would be just the title track, Out on Bail. When Will first had the idea for Out on Bail, that was going to be the intro to the project. And he was sitting there jamming it. Boom! Word to the motherfucker. Boom! He was like, I can't. It can't be an intro. We got to do a song. So that's how that started. And he probably said, no, no, intro. I'm like, no, drag song. <laughs> intro. Song. Intro. Song. I just naturally talk shit. Yeah, and he's been mad at me because I had the, the uh, blueberry muffins and he had the okra. And ever since then, it's been, I've been throwing muffins at him and he's been throwing okra at me. Wine dot high, Washington high. So he had three quarters of the hood, I had the other quarter. Just because you're a white guy in Wyandotte High doesn't mean you automatically get accepted or pulled into that. I mean... So how did you get it? I have no idea. You would have to ask them. We had ghetto passes. I would like to think that I got along with everybody back in the day. I was a bit of a class clown, so that helps. I was a DJ. I was into the music scene. Like drag, I got along with everybody. I'd be outside freestyling, beatboxing, then later playing music. Music is international and it, it, it crosses a lot of boundaries. Always has. I believe Will and I were on Parallel Parkway in Kansas City, Kansas, pulled up to a stoplight, and there was a guy listening to a song that we did, not from Selling Narcotta or Out on Bail. It was just a demo song that we had done. First time I heard somebody bumping my shit. So we're at the stoplight. I lean over and I'm like, hey, who are you listening to? And he said, Draggy D, man, you know nothing about that. And I'm like, huh, and pulled off. And I thought to myself, that guy had no idea who he was talking to. I'm that dude. Honestly, I think when we first had someone Narcotta and came back and we had it and I was holding it and it was the first time that it was like, this is our music, like here it is. And I could sell it and it was legit, you know, people could hear it. It went and it went beyond just us. So then now we're putting it in stores and just the response. So it was like that first, like, it's kind of like in, in Crush Groove when they're carrying the boxes of records and it became real. It was like, oh yeah, like we're doing this because nobody at the time that we knew was pressing up any music. So the fact that we had actual product, it had it out, it was in stores, somebody can come up because back then people would talk shit. Oh, really? You're going to do some music? You ain't ever going to do shit. You can't do that. Baby. But then you had it and it was like, really? Oh, here you go. $10. You know, like, so that actually was a, a great memory because it, it shut people up. Nope. There were no real live venues, but in Kansas City at the time, nobody was letting any rappers perform. And unless you were at a house party and those were far and few between that you could actually have a system where people could get on a mic. But uh, the only one we knew of was in Lawrence. And? Yeah, there were a couple of guys that uh, would put together some sort of a talent show. I think they mimicked Living Color. We would always try to get on, and we were always promised next month, next month, because they would religiously do these shows every month. And a month would go by and nothing. Next month, that would go by and nothing. So we pretty much knew that that was not going to be our venue. Despite we're the only ones that had any kind of album out, it was in stores, selling everywhere. If we weren't fucking their girls, 
They might have read us on the show, Drag. No comment. Next question. The Selling Narcotta video. Yeah, we did a video in college for Selling Narcotta. And we just had a bunch of us knuckleheads out there and uh, filming. And it was, it'd be nice to get a hold of that again. And I don't know if we would look at it in awe or if we would laugh to see how stupid we looked in it, but piece of history, that's for sure. My copy got lost over the years. My mom threw mine away because there was, I think we were cutting up cocaine, but it was really like flour and she didn't like that at all. So she just pitched it. And since she was gangster, she told me that she pitched it. She didn't even lie. Where's my tape at? Oh, I threw that shit out. She, she was never one to mince words. We love music, but it wasn't something that we just talked about regularly. He was doing his thing, I was doing mine. And we just were, were friends. I mean, hell, he's like my older brother, you know? Every older brother has a cuter younger brother, and it's okay. I've always wanted one and have never run into that. But. <laughs> so we, when we started talking about music, he was coming down to see me. I just was like, hey, I, I got a bunch of beats, you know? Uh, do you have anything you want to say? And he, of course, he says no. First and foremost, like always. Then he calls him back a week later and he's like, well, he said, send me beats. I sent him a bunch of stuff. Then he's like, well, I, yeah. And then he shows up with 10 songs written. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm a writer. It's what I do. I mean, even when I stopped doing music, I was always writing things down putting things together. Might not be full songs, but there would be verses. I think if you're programmed that way as a writer, that's just who you are. At home, I've got stacks of books with uh, stuff that I've written. And a little tidbit to those of you for Return of the Bad Guy, Will asked me to rummage through some of that and see if I could find an old song to do and that song was man behind the mic most people don't know i wrote that 22 years ago and he somehow resurrected that and made it to a song if you think about that you write something 22 years ago and record it today to see if it has any substance or any meaning and back then i was just a guy who loved music but I had a job. How am I gonna make these two things work? And I still think it's relevant today. There's a lot of people out there who are trying to juggle two separate things to try to make it work. Some are successful at it, and some aren't. I don't know, everyone is different. It might inspire, and if it does, that's great. But our music isn't for everyone. We know this and that's okay. You have some people who are young wanting to chase their dreams. And I mean, you never know what will inspire people. He's just being him. I'm just being me. Our stories are different, but we all have our stories. We all have our, our, our paths. And you know, if, if they inspire somebody, great. I mean, but I don't think we ever set out to inspire anybody. We're just really doing what we feel is what we want to do in our hearts. I think from out on bail, every well, the most popular song was Another Dead Homie. Conversation at the Crossroads has a Jeff Holly verse in it. And uh, another appearance from a, a person who has passed, so won't give away any spoilers. You guys are just gonna have to wait for it. But this will be 30 years that Jeff passed away. And trying to pay homage to something like that is difficult. But he came up with a track that we were able to kinda have some of the old and the new brought together. And we've, you know, I think all of us have had people who have passed on and to recreate that 
with a different vibe, with a different setting. I think we did the song justice, and I hope when you hear it, you get that too. It's more of a spiritual song now. It's more uplifting. It's, it's still a sad topic, but I think it's, uh, it's something special, and I'm proud of it. From the dot, we have a modern version of it, a re-envisioning, because we're not in the dot, but we're always from the dot no matter where we go. So we carry part of that with us. And you may not be there currently, but it raised you, it helped teach you, it molded you. And so you're, you'll always be from the dot if you're from the dot. So we wanted to do something that just kind of paid homage to those people that are from the dot. What is this gangsta clause you speak of? I know, not what you have discussed. We made a Christmas song 30 years ago. 32 years ago. It was so awful. It was been 1990. I'll spit a verse <laughs> if I remember. <laughs> Rudolph, he might be dead. His, he's on that cane, his nose is red, or something ridiculous. Gang, 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 gangsta claws. That's, uh... That's something I'm not proud of. <laughs> That's something that needs to stay hidden, buried. No, it's in the vault. It's even in the vault. And that vault needs to be thrown out in the ocean. Today, it's just him and I. So if I want to sing Mary Had a Little Lamb on a track, then I'm going to sing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Hell no. Billy had a little lamb? No. Susie had a little dam? Hell no. I knew a guy who was a tram? I mean, there if you, you can make it work. Next album, it look fits. for it. Uh-oh, the antagonist. Where we go this Monday, I used to have a wife, and I was always the bad guy. I had kids. They had rules. I was always the bad guy. You have a job. You have to instruct people to do things and they don't like it. I'm the bad guy. So it just kind of seemed fitting that, well, I wore the black hat for so long, I might as take something, ne take something negative and turn it into a positive. I'm a bad man. Enjoy the return of the bad guy and look out for the protagonist coming soon. Bye. Adios. I am the bad guy. <laughs>